we weren't going to let a global pandemic get in the way of giving you information and advice about VFX animation and games. So, well, first of all, I'll ask each member uh, of the panel here to give about sort of 30 seconds or so about who you are, what you do, and where you do it. Uh, let's start off with Jess. Uh, I work for Ardman Animations. Uh, we do a wide, wide variety of uh, types of production, um, as well as using different, not, not just in terms of genre, but also in terms of m methodology. Uh, we do stock frame, which we're most well known for. Um, we do CGI, VFX, post-production, um, on commercials, features, series, co-productions, um, so it's a it's a sort of big uh, remit that we've got, but we we do um, in that sense look for people, talent, young talent, emerging talent from you know all across the different genres. So um, that's why I'm very interested in meeting you. So yes, Mark Flanagan here, originally from Ireland, graduated as an architect, moved into architectural visualization, then the video games industry in the UK. Moved over to Australia to do that, um, moved into education, so taught in many universities, and then moved to Canada to work in the visual effects industry with Double Negative, and back to the UK again, my world tour, almost completed, <laughs> um, working for Industrial Light Magic, uh, where I worked for about a year and a half as an internal trainer. My current role in Epic is um, education partner manager, which means I speak with lots of universities and lots of courses around Europe, the Middle East, and Africa about how to best use our tools to enable their students to actually meet industry requirements. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Paul, uh, Head of Advertising and Talent Acquisition at Technicolor. So myself and my team look after two advertising brands, MPC and The Mill. Um, we, I've been with MPC for just over six years, and then um, in January started looking after the, the Mill's recruitment as well. We predominantly do visual effects, um, obviously for the advertising side, but also uh, motion design led work and full CG animation, uh, as well as kind of experiential and digital projects. So <clears throat> myself and my team, we look at all of the candidates that are applying for roles. We review CVs, portfolios. We also do all the contact with universities and schools and outreach uh, to find new talent and, and then also you know, source more senior and experienced talent um, from uh, you know from the industry people that we're, we're looking to hire 30 seconds here we go um yeah so i'm founder and director of access vfx um so as saint said at the start uh, which is a industry uh, non-profit pursuing inclusion diversity awareness and opportunity in vfx animation and games industries um made up of 60 plus animation vfx and game studios a bunch of colleges unis education edu educators i think it's fair to say and a bunch of industry bodies, trade bodies as well. So it's pretty, a mighty number of people, 150 people. Um, day job is I'm learning and development at PlayStation, only about four or five weeks in. And formally, obviously, I used to work for The Mill for seven years as uh, head of L&D there. And before then, I launched a, num a number of uh, outreach initiatives and uh, internal programs at Channel 4. So I know a little bit about um, entry-level roles, um, but also I've learned an absolute ton from the Access VFX team, present company accepted. You know, we've run a lot of podcasts. <laughs> I'll probably be stealing a lot of nuggets from all the, uh, the staying, standing out while staying in podcasts we've run already. Um, so I'm in good company, but also I, I hope I can bring uh, some of the feedback we've had from a lot of our Access VFX mentees. Um, I've been kind of um, sourcing some info from uh, up, upwards of about 625 mentoring partnerships and some of the challenges they're finding both in terms of getting into industry currently, but also, um, you know, the current challenges around lockdown as well and, and what it looks for, for uh, talent going into 2021. So, yeah, a lot of little bits and bobs, but that's me in a nutshell. My name's Sarah Tanner. I'm the HR director here at um, Jellyfish Pictures. i um, been here now for nearly three years. Um, this was my first experience of um, visual affection visual effects and animation industry actually. So Jellyfish Pictures, um, we do visual effects and animation. Um, we also do quite a lot of IP development work. Um, we have co-pros and so on with um, uh, working with other um, companies as well, developing new projects. We do TV series animation. Um, we've done like Dennis and Asher Unleashed. Um, we have done Bits and Bob, Flugels, um, and now we're mo moving into the sort of feature animation world, working on uh, working with, you know, kind of on that sort of thing. We did 
Dragon's Homecoming, that kind of thing. So we've got um, we've got kind of a, a raft of um, raft of uh, kind of skill sets and experience within the team, visual effects, a lot of things, and animation. Um, so yeah, Jellyfish has got a whole kind of a, a raft of people from all different kind of areas um, that we have right from entry level roles right through to incredibly senior and experienced people. So um, about 300 people um, um, worldwide now. We used to be UK based, but now based on the current situation, we're obviously like many places, we're, we're actually worldwide working at the moment, which is really exciting. Great, great opportunities for, for people all over, really. I'm going to kick off with a, a few questions. And the first question really is about getting information and we have to remember that people on this call may be just starting on their journey into VFX animation or computer games. They're not necessarily working in the industry, they're more the other end looking at what they have to do to get in. And the first question really is about getting information. So what are the main sources of information people should refer to when they're trying to find out about VFX animation and games? Where would you look for information and clear advice? So just paint me a picture of where you would look if you were you know, out there looking for that kind of information, uh, whether it's online or, or elsewhere, and of course, mainly it'll be online at the moment, but where would you look for information and advice about VFX animation and games? And we'll start with Jess, if, if we may. Well, there's a question. It's very broad. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks for that. Um, I think um, the, uh, it's very difficult to answer in one answer because the industry is so broad and there's so many different elements to it um i think it's you need to kind of think about which area it's like when people say how do i get into media you know media is enormous um and i think what you need to do the first thing to do is to think about what you're good at and what you enjoy doing and i think those things can lead you to looking at areas um of specialism once you know that, so you know I want to get into games, you know, again, the difference between games and TV and series is, is another, they're all different worlds. So although they cross over in lots of ways, um, you know, I think you need to figure out first, for me, the, the biggest point would be what do you actually want to do and what are you good at? Um, and then once you've worked out what that is, then you can start narrowing it down into, do I want to go into apprenticeship? Do I want to go into, go to college? Um, do I need to go to college? Do I need to go to university? Um, and, you know, then those, then you can start kind of narrowing it down that way. Um, yeah. But I think um, in terms of just wanting to get into the industry broadly, I think it's just um, a bit too wide, perhaps. Yeah, so let, let's narrow it down then. In, in your case, then, sort of say I wanted to know more about the animation industry and, you know, what was involved with animation. Where would I look for information? Would I, I mean, the Arden website for one thing, I guess, but are there other sources? There's a whole range of magazines. There's um, online magazines. There's um, groups. There's tutorial groups. There's a lot of free tutorial groups, people that give information out. Um, I know, um, obviously, Access VFX is newish, but we're, we're in there with, with them. We joined um, just at the end of last year, I believe. Um, and that has been a big gap I think in the industry for a long time for people who aren't on a trajectory or on a journey already and they just want to know how they can break into it even if they haven't studied any of those subjects etc so I'd say definitely without trying to be too like on brand Access VFX is a really good place to start seriously um, any of the sort of universities or colleges or online courses that offer courses in animation will you will be able to speak to someone and find out what they offer and what you need to have to get in there in terms of qualifications or if you need to put some work together. Um, there's spectacular colleges all over the world. We work with quite a few. I'm sure everyone else does as well. Um, universities, colleges, art schools, you know, you just need to be able to call them up and, you know, find out what their admissions policy is, if that's the way you're going to, you know, if you're going in, in that direction. Um, there's a lot of resource online. Great, thanks. And uh, I guess the same question to Mark from a games point of view. If, if you're interested in games and you're maybe you're even studying games, but where would you look for advice about the games industry and what roles are available, etc.? Well, one of the first places I'd look is right behind your shoulder. Um, <laughs> you may see there you've got the core skills of VFX, which is a fantastic online document, which has been around for a number of years now, and it's been added to and updated, I think, 
three or four years ago. That's fantastic across all industries. Um, something which I'd say about games and broader industries, including animation and visual effects, is a lot of them are now moving towards what we refer to as more interactive. We've done a lot of work recently seeing how this is changing things. So I think we have published some information ourselves about interactive careers, which are in film and they're in um, animation and they're in lots of other areas. Um, I would say, again, what Jess has said, look what your skills and look what you love doing and see how they relate to these careers. All of these industries are not just about being an artist or being an animator. They include lots of other things as well, including people like myself, trainers, um, people who are in recruiting, people who are in accounting, all these other things, which is still part of the same industry. If you have a passion for doing something, it's almost certain there's a job for you within these industries. So think about what you really like doing because you'll be doing it for a long time and try and turn that into what you do. Lots of resources online, lots of stuff on um, Escape's um, website, lots of stuff in Access VFX. See what actually you think you like doing. If you are lucky enough by the time you leave school to know you're very fortunate, but sometimes it'll take you years and don't be afraid to try and change your mind. Can I move on to Paul now? And Paul, from a, from a VFX point of view, and maybe you're going to say the same thing as everybody else, and that's fine. Uh, but from a VFX point of view, where would you go if you were a student wanting more information on the VFX industry? Yeah, I mean, I think there's different facets to this and sort of echoing some of the things that Mark said, because I think, you know, you can start with the companies. You know, there might be content that you see, films or adverts that you're really excited by what you see, and then you establish who did that work and really dive deeply into those companies and understand what they do, where they are, what type of people they employ. And then there's the job roles and the careers, you know, whether it's technical or creative, which might require some um, some skills that you need to, to get before you can even be considered for a role. Or, again, as Mark said, you know, non-technical creative roles like production or um, other kind of supporting roles where there's no pre-requirement for specific skills, just the interest and enthusiasm. Um, so, you know, it's, it sort of turns into a big research project, really, around uh, acquiring all that information. I mean, one of the things that, um, you know, we've, um, we were involved in and have referred to lots of time uh, are the uh, career maps that are on the Screen Sills website for VFX, for animation. Uh, there we go, look perfect. <laughs> um, you know, something like that that really breaks down the job roles specifically and talks about what that job is. You know, that's the thing. We, we have to appreciate that people that are finding out about this industry, there's terminology and job titles that, you know, on the surface don't even mean anything. And, and you know, that's a whole learning process to understand what those jobs are. Mm. Great, thanks. And uh, Sarah, I sort of uh, maybe a, a, on a wider case here, sort of, you know, people talk about kind of, uh, I don't know, soft skills or kind of professional skills. You know, what kind of skills are, 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 are useful across the piece for, you know, uh, video games, uh, animation and visual effects? Just to um, just emphasise a couple of the points that the guys have made there that are really, really important. That mm. I, I mentioned at the beginning of my intro, I've only been in the industry for three years and I came from a completely different world um, of um, retail, uh, insurance, television news, I had a bit of media background. Um, so I came into this world and I hadn't even heard of half of these jobs to, to Paul's point. And if you open up this map and you get it digitally online, it's enormous and all these jobs I can barely pronounce. And so the very first thing for me, uh, just to reiterate, is, you know, don't don't pigeon your house, uh, hole, you know, pigeonhole yourself into it, into your thinking you want to do something. It's a lot about a lot broader. Think about the skills, what you're, you're interested in, what you're passionate about, how you love to be, you know. Um, and to answer your question a bit more there, um, saying around kind of the softer skills, um, what again, coming not from a non-technical background in many ways when I'm looking to recruit, there are a whole host of other skills which are equally balanced really when we're recruiting someone. We're not gonna be taking on someone who's technically brilliant, artistically amazing, if they cannot communicate with people, are awkward, don't particularly work very hard. Do you, do you know what I mean? Lots of things mm -hmm. that actually are equally balanced in terms of what we're looking for. And actually you can teach people 
technically how to improve. You can um, help mould their artistic talent. You know, inherently you may have a, a, a passion for that. But really, fundamentally, you need to have the core skills to be able to communicate to people, to talk to people, to push yourself out of your comfort zone a bit, which is really hard to connect with someone, say hello to someone, um, think you're going to embarrass yourself, but you're not. You're invariably not going to embarrass yourself, but people are pleased if you kind of just have, you know, have some, you know, oomph about you to be able to introduce yourself and keep knocking on the door. Um, so about the communication, about the te teamwork, be able to support each other, help each other, keep your head mm -hmm. up. Look, who else needs some help with the team? I'm doing all right, Jack, here. So how, how about my classmate he I know he's struggling a bit or she's struggling a bit how can I help her you know use all the skills you can at, of being a person and communicating so don't un, don't underestimate that the importance of that because actually they're really really fundamental to, to have and you don't actually have to have got that from industry you can get that from your you know your part-time jobs you can get that when you're babysitting and looking after having to interact with kids you can get it from any kind of you know helping out your neighbor because you've been doing her shopping over the last few weeks so you're having to talk a bit more and get organized and you know all the basics is all helping mold the skills you really will need in in life and in, in the job so great. all of those are really important great thanks now simon you've got the unenviable position here of trying to sort of add to all that wealth of uh, information that other people have got but where would you know people who are starting out on their journey look for information about these industries? Uh, off the bat, I'd say e-mentoring. I mean, I know I'm shouting at XSV FX again, which doesn't need any more uh, love <laughs> 20 minutes in. Um, but we set up the uh, e-learning the, the e platform back in 2017 as a way to mentor young people as young as 13 years old. Started off with local schools in Camden, then it became a regional piece across the UK back at the end of 2018. And then in 2019, it became a global e-mentoring platform. So we have mentors across animation, VFX and games on there, willing mentors um, based in the US and Canada and um, in the UK, all over the country. Um, and it's a, a completely um, legit space for uh, people to be mentored and find out exactly what they need. So everybody's spoken on this, this call about um, knowing what you want to do. Paul's piece around starting with the studios, everything Mark said about understanding what kind of artist you want to be or what kind of discipline you want to work in. You can refine those conversations on a one-to-one -one basis in a completely safe space. So all mentors are DBS checked. It's on a, it's on a private Slack channel that's monitored. Uh, if there are any parents uh, on the line who uh, have concerns about that kind of thing. And uh, the mentors have access to all of the other mentors. So if it's on Slack, if somebody doesn't know the answer to anything, they can jump on the Hello Mentors Slack thread and go, hey, my mentee wants to know X, Y, and Z, or you know, here's a piece of animation. I'm not, an, I'm, I'm not an animator. What do you think? And then you can get that intel from upwards of you know, 300 mentees. Um, from a global, and the, the global piece is great because you can also get your, your mentor from LA or something. You know, mm. It's not time zone dependent. It's not even time dependent. You don't have to have that hour. And it really has worked. I mean, uh, it's getting more and more expensive to renew it year on year because the numbers are increasing and it's completely free. So it's a completely free offering that, that, that Access VFX do because that's what we're about is nothing we, we, we do costs money. So that's what I'd say off the bat. And everything everybody else said, screen skills, Access VFX. I've, since I've been working at PlayStation, I've come across uh, Gratin Games, do some nice stuff. And uh, Declan, uh, who runs Into Games, who I was connected to about two years ago, they kind of do what Access VFX do, but for the games industry. And uh, Declan put me in touch with uh, SideQuest, who do some really cool stuff, like basically just build your own games. Uh, you know, people have got a bit more time on their hands now. Well, that's what I hear. Um, so, yeah, that's my take on it. Moving on, I've got a question now. And again, I'm thinking about those pe people who are studying, you know, games or animation uh, VFX at the moment. And maybe you're thinking, well, I'm not really sure if I'm really cut out for this particular industry. Um, how transferable are the kind of skills? So if you're, if you're, you know, if you're studying animation, for instance, and then by the end of your course, you go, you know what, games is more what I'm about. H how easy is it to transfer across? And for those of you who are you know, in HR or in positions of recruiting as well, do you see lots of people sort of translating across those industries? So how easy is it to sort of you know, move across those industries? Uh, hands up who wants to, <laughs> rather than me going round this time round. Uh, Sarah, over to you first. Even maybe six or nine months ago, I think sometimes 
the industries could be quite distinct between visual effects and animation. A little bit of a historical thing in the sense of visual effects is visual effects, animation is animation. Perhaps people were moving less between them. But you know what? <laughs> in the last three months, suddenly things are a whole new, uh, whole new uh, way of thinking and, and being. And, and we're a good example of that, I think, um, internally here at Jellyfish, as I'm sure you are at a lot of the other companies, that we had a quite a significant amount of people who suddenly weren't able to pick up visual effects work temporarily while lots of projects were put on hold. So rather than losing their fantastic skill set that we knew we had, we then look for other roles that we had internally. And now actually they've transferred or have been starting to transfer yeah. over into the animation side of things. So I think actually it's sort of breaking down the barriers currently um, in a way. And it's also opening people's minds to the fact that maybe they always thought they wanted to work in sort of the visual effects or the games or animation. But actually maybe they're thinking, do you know what? I have to think about other things now because, you know, I need to um, because of the opportunities may be slightly different now. Um, and so people are moving between, between them. And it, it's not easy in the sense it's not seamless, but you have the absolute some very transferable skills um, and experience. They're very different ways of working in the different, in, in the different um, uh, sectors of visual effects and animation, games, but you've got some very core fundamental skills. So you can't probably just finish one day, start on another. It's sometimes easier to do it within maybe a company that, that maybe does, you know, perhaps like an Aardman or, you know, lots of different, different companies that, that allows that because you're a known person and so on. But you can absolutely do that. Um, it's just about um, doing some more tests yourself. It's doing some online courses, perhaps showing some of the work that you can do to show the transferable skills as well, which is very easy to do now and updating your reel, your show reels and your portfolios to show that. So you can do it. You, you definitely can do it. It's just keeping your mindset open, I think, um, mm. more than anything. Mark, you, you had your hand up. Do you want to say anything, add anything to that? I have done this many times. I started off as a decision architecture, then worked in games, then um, education, visual effects, now back in, in games. Um, I think if you have skills at a reasonably high level in any of these sectors, um, they transfer. Um, so I've, I've seen quite a lot of people in animation, for instance, who have started off as architects. It's quite a common thing to see. Um, there are skills as a lighting designer within these um, realms, which are pretty much transferable. A lot of it is knowing what you want something to look like and then making it look like that. There are some people who become entrenched in their view that film animation and VFX animation are very different things, but I know people who transition between those and they see it the same way being able to play classical music and jazz music. You know, it's, you know how to play music, um, given the chance to do so. So I think the skills are transferable, given a chance and given the fact that you want to be across these disciplines or across these different realms. Um, some people just love doing one thing, but at the same time, a change can be really, really beneficial. And I've found being able to transfer my skills through different disciplines has made them grow at each step of doing it because you learn new things and then you bring them back to the next one. So I think when you're at the early part of your career or studying, there's going to be time and sort of energy limitations to be able to do everything. You know, I think as Mark was saying, as you develop your career, you, it's probably easier the further you go to flex um, your skills across a number of different areas. I think it's important for people starting out that they do try and, and try as many things as possible and see where they enjoy and where their strengths are. But, you know, there is limited time. So it may well be that you then have to pick something and invest a little bit in that, whether it's, I mean, using the example of animation, whether it's more stylized animation or more realistic, you know, it's very difficult to become an expert in both of those very quickly. So, you know, it's something that, you know, you need to invest quite a lot of time in. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, it, it's likely that when someone's starting out, they probably will go in one direction, but then that opportunity to, to transfer probably comes a little further down the line. Mm. Great. Simon or Jess, do you want to come in on that question as well about transferability of skills? But yeah, I mean, not a huge amount. Just that um, having spent a lot of time in the industry now, I've seen um, people come into industry, particularly through the running programs, um, thinking they know exactly what they want to do. And within a year, they've completely transitioned to a completely random different department. I mean, when I was at the mill, I saw like the design team grow and the emerging tech and creative tech team grow. And to Mark's point, all the software is completely transferable. I mean, I like the, uh, the jazz classical music analogy. I mean, it is really, you know, it's all so transferable. And there's a lot of movement, particularly in creative and artist roles around the industry anyway, the, the broader industry. 
so I wouldn't sweat it too much. Mm -hmm. Je Jess, do you find uh, people come to Ardman now with more variety of, sort of skills, like people from games and people from VFX? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just backing up what everyone said without without repeating everything, um, certainly we do have a quite a wide range of people um, that move around the different departments, the different genres within the company for us. And I know it happens in many different companies as well, um, even to the point where practical animators like stop frame animators train to become CGI animators or 2D animators train to become CGI or so many different types of software at the moment as well. And there's always more coming out where one particular project may be better, you know, maybe better for them to use, you know, Toon Boom or something that they've never used before for, for just growing on out of the air. Um, so a lot of people, even very high up, you know, in senior levels in their career, retrain into different areas to enable them to work on a project that they want to work in, which is a slightly different um, uh, way of working. But, <clears throat> and also uh, what I did want to say as well is don't stress too much about it at this stage, mm -hmm. because there's going to be jobs available when we're all really old and you're massively successful in the industry that don't even exist at the moment. Mm -hmm. And the crossover is, changing so fast at the moment, you know, it's just being really agile with your approach. What you want to do, I think the most important thing is just finding out what your passion is and, you know, hopefully that marries into what you're good at. I mean, ideally, like everyone else said, you're going to be doing this or some aspect of this job for a long time, hopefully. So, you know, really focus on what you're good at and you can always improve in areas that you're not that good at, but, you know, genuinely you'll have a talent somewhere in one area. But um, mm. yeah, don't worry about it. It's moving so fast. You know, it's yeah. kind of, even in the last six months, that, you know, Sarah just said recently they've changed. I mean, we're just crossing over. We're looking at projects that are changing every day, really, in their execution. Mm, great. Thanks. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up the idea of passion and sort of ambition and, uh, you know, choosing what you, you'd like to do and, and be good at rather than sort of trying to fit into a, 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 a role which you've heard is kind of out there. And, and based on that, you know, there are a number of people on this uh, uh, in this session, no doubt, who are, are studying and uh, maybe some of them are on media courses. And, you know, everybody tends to want to be either a present, TV presenter or a director when they first start out. And I'd like to ask you all sort of, you know, obviously there are a whole realm of other uh, sort of uh, jobs out there in, in your respective sort of industries. What are the kind of jobs which you think in the back of your head, I wish people would sort of know about this job and want to do it rather than just directors or TV presenters or all the jobs which seem very glamorous. Well, what are the kind of like hidden jobs in your industry which, you know, you think should be known more about and it would be great if people studied and, and uh, went into those roles? Uh, who wants to go on that? Oh, Mark. First one is production. The unsung heroes of all of our industry. Most people don't know that they exist, but without them, nothing gets done. And Really, it is fantastic to have good production and more courses in production. I know there's a few of them around, but it is a great career. And yeah, that's the one that most people don't even know exists. Could you just you know, briefly say a couple of words about what you mean by production for those who won't know? It, it varies across different industries, but in visual effects, for instance, it's the people who will plan the whole process. They will project managers, they will go around, and they'll make work gets done on a daily basis. At higher levels, they are actually people who interact with um, directors and producers externally to make sure that um, timeframes are being achieved and that the director's vision is being met. Um, it, it goes from everything to somebody who is literally on the floor walking around with their laptop in their arm, checking to make sure that the daily schedule has been met to the person who is dealing with your James Camerons um, on a daily basis. So it's that whole career progression between there and probably about between 30% and 40% of our industry is made up of these people who don't actually get noticed when you look at the credits at the end of films, but they make things happen. Uh, anybody else from the panel like to add to that? I'd like to build on what Sarah was talking about, about the wider uh, studios and uh, something like finance, for example, or even talent and people on, on this call, people who are recruiting. I mean, they're they're really rewarding roles and um, in my previous role I remember that you'd get a runner who said he says I want to work in finance and it was just like a drink of cold water on a hot day you know it was like amazing <laughs> somebody who doesn't want to be a producer or an artist and um, from my perspective having not occupied a necessarily creative role 
Um, there's, it's quite nice working in a, what's perceived as quite a dry role in a very cool industry. You know, working in finance, managing a budget on a big feature film or show or is actually really, really interesting. And to Mark's point about production, all the stuff that you all enjoy, games, film, commercials, whatever, doesn't happen without that infrastructure. And you actually get more of an understanding of um, almost a holistic view of a show. You know, when you're working as an artist, that's your bubble. Whereas actually as a producer or the back office, you get the entire piece. So I think there's a lot of unsung heroes. Without going on about it, but I can't emphasize enough to, to everyone here that, you know, you, you see this, you'll go onto the web, you know, some websites, you can look at all these jobs. But do you know what, for me, I, I, you know, I've worked in some industries which maybe aren't quite so exciting, uh, which is an understatement. Um, I walk into my job every day, which could be a really dry role, could be really dull, but I get to um, see amazing work and work with incredibly talented people on in a real, truly team um, collabor collaborative um, uh, role, really, because you have the HR, your finance, you have production accountants, you have any possible skill you've got, any passion. If you're passionate about the industry, if you're passionate about visual effects, animation, beautiful artwork, whatever. If you love organizing things, if you anyone with any sin, single skill can find a role. And if you're passionate about the industry, then honestly, there will be something for you that would really, really be right up your street. Um, so I can't emphasize I, again, just don't just look at the artist you don't have to be an amazing artistic or technical talent um, there's lots of other things um, and very very rewarding roles which are um, often really hard to recruit for as well great thanks and you mentioned there sort of uh, uh, exciting roles and we talked about passion and you know there's also a, a level of unpredictability about the creative industries as, as well and you know a, a lot of people studying now will be a bit worried about things like job security uh, you know you know will they find a role is there a career there and you know it's often you know, some people can be critical of the creative industry and say it's very hard to have a career in them. Uh, do you think this is true? And what are the sort of positive and negative aspects of working on one job and then moving on to another and moving on to another? Because the industries are based very much around projects and finishing a, a, a product. So, so what are the negative and positive aspects of working in the creative industry, do you think? There are so many different types of roles. It's really hard, which I know is really non-specific and not very helpful. But, um, you know, there's freelancer roles. There's people who are freelancers who work on features who are a freelancer, but they've got a role for three years or something. You know, there's people that spend a couple of weeks at a time on a, on a particular project in a short form commercial or something, and then they move on to something else or they travel the world. But there, there are so many different types of roles in so many different countries all around the world that, you know, you could spend your internship in Vancouver or something and then go and work in New Zealand and go and work on a show or, you know, it's, um, those are the positives. Obviously, the, the, the fear of never working again, you know, I know I've been a freelancer, you know, not taking holidays because you never think you're going to get off in something else again or whatever, you know, it's, um, but, you know, it is uncertain, but I think the world's uncertain um, anywhere, especially now, given given what we've just um, sort of in the middle of. So I think you just got to you've just got to be brave and go out there and just you know go for it. There's enough. There's hundreds of thousands of roles, um, and you know if you're good, you'll make it. You know, and you you will. People do all the time, every day, all over the world. So you've got to be brave, and you've got to you know really go out there and, and um, do your best and try and be a team player and, you know, influence people, talk to people, learn from people that you're working with. If you're running somewhere and you want to be, you know, you can see the role that you want to do, see what you can do to go and talk to people. Most people that I know in creative industries are lovely and they want to help people and they'll answer your question and you're not bugging them. And I just think that's the, it is uncertain and it is frightening. Um, but, you know, we, you know, there's lots of roles out there. Often. Yeah, because I know as a parents are often sort of worried about sort of people working in these industries because of that lack of a kind of 10-year career in front of you. Mark, over to you. I would say that there's never been a better time in animation, in visual effects, in games. There's never been a better time, but it looks like it's getting better. Um, people's appetite for content keeps on growing. If you see the amount of online work which is being done now, which is huge, I'm, I'm sorry, I should say streaming, streaming um, television work, which is of huge quality and really, you know, 
very, very lucrative for people to work on. Um, there's more games and bigger games coming every year. And animation is now a huge industry globally, which it, it grew from being, you know, a, a century ago when it started being basically the, the poor relative of the um, film industry to being now probably the, one of the most lucrative and one of the, the most growth that we've seen in the past 20 years. So mm-hmm. I think it's growing and people have a, an appetite, a growing appetite for more content and good stories and for people to tell them. You just have to be good enough to do it and everybody has that ability if they try, if they really find the thing they love doing and follow that. I went to the, um, at the um, uh, BFX festival last year. Um, there was a mother in the crowd who was precisely talking about this saying, look, I'm an accountant. I went into an accountancy role because my parents said, it's kind of like a good career path, a job for life. She said, I've done my job. It's fine. I've done my job all my life. My daughter is incredibly talented and I really want to push her into the industry. But am I being really, um, am I just being a reckless person saying go into it because you'll never have sustain a job in the creative industries? Well, it's such an old fashioned view now, I think, about um, having a job for life anyway, that I don't know any person, regardless of being in the creative industry, who's stayed in a job for more than probably two or three years anyway. So, you know, then you're sort of weighing up what do you want to do with your life and how do you want to live your life? And, you know, as, as um, Jess was mentioning earlier, some of these projects can be really long. And, and as long as you are prepared to get stuck into a project, um, you don't have to be the highest rung on the ladder to have more job security. It, it, you could be doing a whole host of roles and consecutively pick up more work. The more you show, the more you work, the more you build your network and it's a sort of a, it's a sort of a, a snowballing effect. You'll have more contacts, you'll meet more people, you'll connect with more people. And there is enormous amounts of opportunity. So albeit you are very unlikely to have a job that on day one in the creative, in some of our sectors that says, right, this is a job for 20 years, but I'm not sure if any, any one of those hundred people on this call or how many people we've got actually want a job for 25 years. I know in my mind that that would scare hell out of me thinking that's what I have to do so it's it's an amazing opportunity to work pick and choose some things you want to work on pick and choose some things that are really you know gonna light your fire and really really gonna kind of make you enjoy your life and enjoy what you're doing every day so the mum said great that's really given me a lot of peace of mind I'm now going to make sure I really push my daughters to get into into that sector so Great, thanks. And Simon, you must have uh, spoken to a lot of parents through Access VFX events and and their worries about the uh, youngsters going into the creative industries. Uh, Have you got any advice for them? I think it's, I mean, you've all got got a decision to make around um, stability as well, right? So if you're going to be an artist, like if you want to be, I I did it way back in the day, I wanted to be a freelance illustrator. There's a huge amount of risk there and, and, you know, you're not you're not going to have a nine to five where you clock in and clock out and get a monthly paycheck. So you either choose to be a, let's say you want to work in, in, in the industry, then you become an in-house artist or you choose to be, a, I've got a mate who uh, is a, is a, is a freelance um, a VFX artist and he travels the world. He's like a nomad. He doesn't even have a home address necessarily. He just kind of trying to get, just goes from job to job. So it's kind of like the path you choose. And there's, I think there's no industry is that state stable. I mean, forget about what's going on at the moment. Um, but one thing I've seen and one thing I always talk about at the events is, you know, the wider VFX animation and games industry has only really been around for the last kind of 30 ish years. So it's still very young in the big scheme of things. And uh, as Mark said, it's growing and growing and developing. And then we've all talked about, like Jess talked about jobs not existing right now that will exist in another 15, 20 years that we can't even comment on now. So I think it's a really exciting time to get involved. Uh, but I'm not going to sell anybody a line. So you, if you work in VFX, you're going to be set for life and you've got, you know, you've got, it's just wouldn't be, wouldn't be honest, but I've, you know, I've gone to a lot of events where I talk to a lot of parents and you, you, you play it safe or you don't, you know, and there's nothing wrong with kind of more traditional careers, but you know, I'd rather work in uh, this industry than insurance. And I've worked in some pretty dry industries in the past. So um, <laughs> it's a personal decision ultimately. Yeah, sorry if there are any insurance people on the line here. So, Nothing against um, insurance. Other careers no, are available. No. <laughs> just, Thank to, you. just to pick up the point on the visas and the sort of international nature of the industry, because obviously, look, you know, you can't get a visa to everywhere, and and that's not possible, particularly when you're starting out in the industry. But you know, there are there are a huge amount of international opportunities, whether that's in Europe, in Canada. Australia, New Zealand, even at an entry level. So, you know, it's thinking about where those routes are and then using that as a platform. And as you 
progress your career, then the opportunity to get visas and move to other countries opens up as well. On that, on that note, I think we'll look at a couple of Q&As now because we, we are getting towards the end. And uh, one that's already been answered, but uh, I thought it'd be good to put forward to all of you is uh, from Charlotte. And she says, can you be self-taught through online courses or do you need a degree to get into the industry? So, so what's the situation with regard to getting these skills? Do you, can you be this kind of uh, person who sits in the you know, bedroom or at home, uh, sort of hoovering up information from the web and become uh, an animator or a, a VFX artist? Or do you need to go to uh, a school or a college or a university or, or, or even an apprenticeship? Who's got a, a point on that? I'd like to jump I mean, on the apprenticeship point oh, super quick. Um, yeah, go on. Yeah, I mean, every apprentice that um, I took on in my previous role, nobody had a, a traditional background, VFX background. Most are self-taught. I mean, the youngest apprentice uh, we took on was uh, 16 years old, Adam. I um, don't know who's listening, probably not. Um, but he had an incredible portfolio, all self-taught. Now he's smashing it. That's one, one example of many across, you know, multiple studios that are involved in the apprenticeship movement. Anybody else? Yeah, I was just going to say that. I mean, I, you know, we've never, a degree has never been a prerequisite to get a job. It's very much portfolio driven in the art disciplines. But um, I think historically, people have had the opportunity to develop a portfolio at university. So that's why the two have kind of aligned. But I think that's changing. And, uh, you know, with access to, to kit and training online, you know, absolutely, there's no reason why someone couldn't uh, acquire the skills and develop a portfolio to get a job without going to uni. We are, and lots of other studios and companies are very passionate about this and, and opening up opportunities for other people um, who perhaps don't have that traditional art school kind of university um, intro. Um, I think also that not all art schools and universities are equal. Um, and you know, that, that's a, that's a whole nother soapbox that I'm not going to get on right now, but I think you have to be quite careful because you could spend, you know, a good chunk of your early career do, doing a course that perhaps isn't necessarily, um, worth it to be honest. And, you know, you might be better off doing it in a, in a different, getting into the industry in a different way. And I just think, you know, that again, coming back to that thing that everyone said so far as talent, you know, if you're talented, you will make it, you know, and you, you've got to you've got to get in there obviously and find a route in clearly and we're trying our best to try and um open up those routes and try and find you um but you know absolutely a university degree in most areas of creative industries i don't think is required and actually especially in live action you know people follow a cameraman around and that's how they learn and that's actually the best way of learning any in most things i think but um you know, some areas are highly technical and, you know, do require, I think, you know, computer science degrees, et cetera. I mean, I may be wrong. You might disagree with me, others, but I do think that some areas would benefit from a degree or a higher, higher qualification. Um, I'd say one of the best ways you can get a job is to show that you can do the job. And you can do that now. You can get Blender. You can get all kinds of free software. You can make films starting today on your phone. Um, so if you can actually show people that you can do the job, they will give you the job. Now that, that's great because it puts me, uh, uh, there's another question here which uh, is by Anonymous and uh, in a way it's a question that can't be answered but uh, they're asking how hard is it to get into the 2D animation industry? I'd like to just extrapolate that a bit and say how hard is it to get into any of your industries because it is a very competitive thing and there are more people than there are places. Uh, you know, everybody wants to get into this industry. So, so could you sort of like give an idea of uh, tips for people to get into your industry and to, to give that extra bit which will get them a role um, because it is so hard. This, I mean, a, a bit of advice that comes up on all of the, uh, the podcasts that we've done recently and previous VFX festival panels is don't just target recruiters. So of course, to contact people on this, uh, this call and, and connect with them on LinkedIn and stuff. But if you are old enough to have a LinkedIn account is um, like my, uh, Paul was saying, you know, you watch a film, you see a show that you, you, you like, and it's in line with what you want to do find out who the more junior artists the mid-level artists on there and connect with them and ask them questions and then it's almost kind of rather than the traditional uh, i'm not dismissing the traditional apply for a job apply for an internship route which is absolutely right and proper but if you want to grow your network which ultimately could lead to a, 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 a route in as well is to start to build it through those meaningful interactions so ask a question come from a place of curiosity 
and start to build those relationships with people who aren't uber creative directors who probably aren't going to have the time to even look at their LinkedIn if they've got one. I'm not saying LinkedIn's the answer, but it's one route. It's an example. I think there's lots of ways you can connect with junior to mid-level talent who are doing what you want to do. And they're nearer peers as well, so they might have more relevant um, advice for you. When you get the opportunity to talk to someone, they're going to say, can you send me what you've got? And you can't go, I'll be with you in a few weeks. You know, you've got to have, you produce as much as you can at the highest level as you can. Um, we employed an animator uh, who sent us, who had gone through an art school, um, but their, their final film was not very good. Um, but they went online and got just a bunch of free um, rigs online, animation rigs, and just, you know, stripped some dialogue from somewhere or created it and put together these, these lovely, very, very simple animations, but showed his extreme talent. And so, you know, he knew that his film wasn't good enough to get him very far. So he just put in the extra legwork for free at home. And, you know, we were just blown away by it. So, um, you yeah, know, get some material together. Very, very quickly on it. And I think one of the key things around it as well is um, absolutely try different people. It's about relationship building. Um, you know, if there's mentor schemes, sign up for some of those. But the thing is, as well, is you have to be really resilient because it is it can be hard, not just in this industry, actually, but any industry. Your first job is hard because there's a lot of people on one level playing field and you've got to try and do these things to make yourself like look a bit different um, and stand out a tiny bit more or just show some of the hard work and the effort and the thought and the skill that you've you put into into your application so don't send off a generic application make it personal make it considered that you've tried to apply to that person because you really want to work for Ardman or jellyfish or whoever else whoever it might be because I, I want you if you want to be with me but i'm less inclined if it's a generic thing because i'm like oh do you really want to be with us or have you sent off 50 of these today? Um, and be resilient because, and keep going back and keep talking to people. A lot of it's about timing. So timing, every week new projects come up, every week new um, team requirements um, arise. So if you're not successful one week, you might have a rubbish week. You've tried to speak to loads of people and nothing happens, but keep going, keep going, keep knocking on the doors of lots of people and you will get in there, but keep your chin up and keep going. I'm going to ask the perennial question about showreels and particularly uh, sort of if showreels are different for the different industries. So a games art showreel, is that different from a VFX showreel? And if you could keep it brief, but just say what you'd want to see most on a showreel and what you don't want to see on a showreel, because sometimes you, you've obviously seen howlers uh, out there as well. So who wants to give some, some pithy advice on what should be on a showreel for each? Uh, I'll go through Paul first. Yeah, um, I'll keep it short and sweet. So, I mean, I think, <laughs> I think quality, obviously, your very best work, and, and that's way above quantity. You don't, you know, it can be very short as long as it's very good. It needs to be relevant to the company that you're applying to and have a certain amount of um, polish, I guess, and finish. Um, you know, that's very much from the advertising point of view. I think when we're looking at reels, we're looking for that finished visual image um, that someone's got an eye for the, the, the detail and the quality of the, the final shot. Great, thanks, Mark. I think you also were going to mention something. Yep. Um, make sure that you have some work which is for your actual target platform. So if you want to get a job in games, make sure you have work which is in games. Um, if you want to do something with visual effects, make sure you actually have something in a final shot. It really helps, even if other people have worked on it. And sometimes that's better because if you have done animation and somebody else has modeled and textured, rigged, whatever else, and you can put that into a final shot, you can show that you contributed to a final shot. The other thing is never put in anything that you would have to make an excuse for it not being good enough. Thank you. Anyone else want to come in on that one? I'd just say front load it with your best work. Because uh, yeah. recruiters don't have a lot of time. If it's six minutes long, it's not going to get watched. Um, Paul's alluding to that. Um, you know, you get so many applications through. So front load it, best work up front, get attention quickly. Because it's probably Thanks. not going to get watched in its entirety. Thanks. Uh, in the questions, uh, Alevas made a point that uh, it's Mental Health Awareness Week this week. And uh, he, he would like to ask uh, if you think that companies do enough to support their artists uh, are, are companies more aware of the kind of the stress and anxiety that some uh, uh, of the professionals might be under? Anybody want to go for that? Absolutely. Um, and we, we at Armin have started a whole way where well, we recently employee owned, so it's changed quite a lot. Mm. Um, but that was a good springboard for 
looking at, you know, interrogating all the different areas of how we work and how we support people. Um, and I know so many of my colleagues in the industry are really looking at it. It, it, it was, there was a bad place and there was a bad time. Um, and I think everyone's really trying to um, move on from that because quite rightly, artists shouldn't accept certain ways of working that, that so perhaps they would have expected to be in the past. Um, and so I really think the industry is moving on, maybe in some ways faster than others, but, um, you know, I definitely think that there's a, a sea change. And also that, that what's been very apparent, even in the last five weeks, is how much we can achieve from home and remotely. Um, we all knew that there was always people working remotely. There's always been people working from, you know, their homes before in small setups, but um, even in, you know, producing huge pieces of work, that we all are, you know, um, very few people, people have actually stopped working if they can work from home, they've got access to remote render farms, etc. So um, it's changing. And also that kind of, you must be in the office from this until this, and then otherwise you're fired and you're never going to get employed again in the industry. It really is changing fast. Just very briefly on that. I mean, not just um, us at Jellyfish, I know across the industry um, um, as well. There's a lot of um, lot more awareness because we have mental health champions um, within lots of the companies as well to try and um, at least have a head in to say, keep a head out and an eye out for people that might need extra help. Um, it's definitely, definitely right up there on our radar at Jellyfish as it is for all of you guys. And I, I know here as well. Um, and we always try and do lots of promotional work and, um, and activities to try and show people that actually, you know, you may have some challenges at any point in time, but who doesn't? Um, and we'll do our very best to help support you. Um, it's not going to stop you or limit you in your career. Definitely. I know we've come to, uh, uh, we're one minute past, and I know um, uh, Daniel's urgently putting some 50p's in the electrical meter here to sort of keep us going. So I'm just going to be cheeky and ask one last uh, question of all of you, even though we're over time. And that is, if you had to give three words to describe where the industry will be after COVID in a year's time, what would those three words be? This is a very creative exercise. So what three words would you describe about the industry in one year's time. Some of you are writing this down, you're taking it far too seriously. Wow, uh, so who's gonna have a, have a first go? In one word, flexible. <laughs> I knew you'd cheat, thank yeah. you. Anybody else? I'd say more creative as well, I think. I yeah, think thanks. This is forcing people to be more, I don't know, one word, me. what more creative could be, I, I don't know. Lateral. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Mark. Paul, help me out here. Oh, well, well, well. I guess what about like sort of distributed teams? You know, I think whilst we're not all going to be working from home forever, hopefully, uh, but I think teams will be more uh, spread out and distributed. There's, there's certainly the opportunity to do that. Great, thanks, Sarah or Jess. Do you want to paint three words? I've got. Um, I had flexible, but Simon stole that. Um, yeah. I think um, gentler, I put gentler and more collaborative um, because it, it, it just, it already feels better. I have to say, just talking to different teams, you know, it's been a very collaborative industry anyway, but I just think that um, it, this, this has changed so much people's perception of, of structure um, that it's actually, it's really, really interesting how it's coming out. And um, I also think a lot more ambitious, you know, uh, Mark touched on it before, the, the, the streaming, the content, the drive for more work and better work um it's it's just really exciting so i think definitely more more ambitious great thank you. i think there's slightly more than three words there but that will let you off that's fine i can't do so three words <laughs> Sarah. i can't do three words you mine, mine is massive worldwide community which um it just feels like our world is becoming smaller in a way and it's incredibly exciting because uh we can employ the visa thing aside, it sort of takes away the need for visa things. If we can have people work visa issues, if we can have people working all over and it is genuinely possible to have much more of a worldwide community within the industry, um, which is really exciting. Great. Thanks. Mark, any last words? I've got two words. One is virtual. Um, and the other is interactive. I think those things are going to change everything. Great, thanks. And uh, I guess uh, virtual is a good way to end it because we're over time and uh, I know Daniel will be sort of uh, after me uh, if I continue much longer. Uh, apologies for people that we haven't 
answered all the questions. That was never going to happen anyway, because uh, this has been a great debate. Thank you all for coming and thank you for your input. And we hope you've got something from uh, these experts in front of you. I'd like to thank Paul, Mark, Sarah, Simon and Jess and you, uh, dear listener and viewer, uh, for being here. And we hope you'll enjoy the rest of the uh, the VFX Festival over the months to come. So thanks very much for coming and thanks to the panel. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>